I'm really looking at an aspect of climate change really from just an education standpoint, but it's certainly not adjust. It's really looking at an important facet where many times we talk about climate change, it's a plug-in. We're looking at something that we want to change, but there's a bigger picture that we have to deal with. And that bigger picture is perhaps really a daily picture. So that's where the ethics come in. And uh, the ethics here uh, were really uh, represented very well in the 19th century by uh, these uh, gentlemen. Oh, who's that guy? Anybody know? Yeah. John Muir. Yeah, great. Boy, this is going to be like Jeopardy, right? You get six, <laughs> 600 points. Man. No dollars, sorry. <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah, there's another one. As you know, this guy. Ralph. Yes, Waldo Emerson, yeah, okay. And this is um, Frederick Church, who's uh, paintings, uh, he has incredible paintings in, um, right here in the Museum of Fine Arts. And, um, <clears throat> oh, this is a pretty cool dude. Greta? Yeah. And, uh, well, this, this is a neighbor, next door neighbor. Yeah, that's Henry. Thoreau, uh, and it's uh, Thomas Cole, another great painter. Oh, who's that? Bolivar. Bolivar, yeah, Bolivar, Simone de Bolivar. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, he was, of course, a major revolutionary force in South America, was able to break away from colonial rule through him, uh, although he certainly had his own problems later on. And by the way, um, if I'm saying things that some people, obviously, it's, a, it's, it's an open talk, so if I'm saying things that you know and it's nothing new, then fine. If it's new, then great. So just bear with me. I apologize for, if I'm repeating things you already know. Here's uh, Juan Gardin Matai from Kenya, great leader. Uh, this is Humberto um, Rios from uh, Cuba. Uh, led a group there. Uh, in the case of Bangladesh, she led a group uh, and started a whole movement to plant over 40 million trees, mostly in Kenya, but extending around the world. Uh, originally for shade and water holding, but we now know, of course, it's a CO2 drawdown. It's uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, so important in that, in that uh, climate change partial solution. Uh, and here uh, in Cuba, they really are among the most sustainable agriculture areas, many areas of Cuba are among the most sustainable in the world, uh, using uh, very little uh, high-tech machinery and mostly organic farming and doing some amazing things there. I've written and spoken here in the United States several times, even before the, the uh, new connections. Uncle Roy from India, we meet later, this is a... Uh, uh, hmm. <laughs> She's from Panama and, and has really organized the whole recycling thinking and a whole new way of thinking about recycling such that workers now are paid decent wages to actually or, or remove the trash, recycle it, and it's among the model places in the world for recycling. Uh, that's in Panama. She's actually been involved with, this is Ikao from uh, uh, Ethiopia, a leader in... <coughs> Uh, stopping mining and, and also interest for dam building in um, Central Africa. Um, and here is a gentleman from uh, Gabon. Uh, this is Mark Enui. And Mark is involved with rainforest preservation on an extensive level in Gabon. Done amazing things leading communities. Uh, this is uh, 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 Jesus Lopez from Mexico doing a lot of restoration with uh, peoples and farmers in Mexico. And uh, uh, she's involved, Aleta Baum, in <coughs> Indonesia, done amazing things with a group of women. These people here may not call themselves Humboldtian, but essentially they're operating in the same mindset, the same ethical mindset, the same perspectives as in the first group that we saw, the Emerson, the, the Darwin, the uh, Frederick Church, and so forth. There's a real connection between the two. And in between is a lot of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> And we have it also expressed, too. We have it expressed, as you saw the New York expression. Um, it was kind of uh, sort of surprising and dynamic in that there were so many 
people from different backgrounds, and in a sense, they were also representing, just like the other two groups we just saw, they were representing to some degree earth-centered ethics. Earth-centered ethics, that is, that they were seeing, putting the earth at a really high and central level. Um, we, uh, and it's uh, so necessary uh, today. And in a sense, they were also one of the first protests perhaps ever organized, or demonstrations, that were just demonstrating to follow science. Most demonstrations are against the war. Change this, do this. This was just, hey, can you recognize science? It would be helpful if you did. That's really what people mindset here was. And to some degree, that's what all the other people are saying in the previous uh, images. <clears throat> that was, uh, so Earth-centered ethics, what are we talking about here? What am I trying to talk about? It's really saying all the people in that would probably agree to some extent with this uh, proverb, a so-called proverb from the Sioux uh, Nation. The frog does not drink up the pond in which he lives. Okay, uh, what does that mean to anybody? To you personally, the frog does not drink up the pond in which she lives, or she lives. Mm -hmm. What do you say? I know. Please. Frog doesn't ruin its home. Frog doesn't ruin its home. It has a surrounding, it's dependent upon its home, and the ultimate home here being the earth, right? So this simple proverb is a guiding light for everyone that we just saw very quickly on the screen, and yet it's not a guiding light in our in our curriculum, really, and in our way of daily operation and thinking. Uh, and in that sense, the frog is way ahead of us. The frog is a fit-in, isn't it? The frog is a fit-in, and humans are, are still trying to learn to be a fit-in. Fit-in with the planet, fit-in with the earth. And so that's where the ethics, again, comes in rather strongly as well. Um, so when we say ethics, we, we, we could start many hours and courses on that, of course. But it usually concerns values of good and bad, right and wrong, usually with human-to-human -human contexts most of the time. And uh, it, over the centuries to today, ethics really are mostly in the form of human-to-human -human focus. I care about you, you care about me, we have to get along, we have to, how do we do that? Well, how do we differ? What's really good? What's really bad in our world? It tends to be divorced from nature when we look through history, right? Really, to the present. It tends to create a second or substitute nature. Humans with, with an ego have created almost a second nature. It's like humans are different from it. We have our own set of rules. That would be a second nature in a sense. Nature has its rules, but we have our own set. Right away, as many of you can see, that's problematic. Uh, and uh, it tends to be more individualistic and less community driven, generally speaking. Tendencies are always good to say in science, right? The tendency. Anybody who's talking absolutes in science is not talking science, obviously. <clears throat> and uh, from the 18th century and still prevalent today, we have these con this kind of thinking. This is not so totally uh, in the past. The world is made for man. Uh, Francis Bacon, these were all philosophers, writers, educators of that time, mostly 18th century, but we humans are the lords and possessors of nature. Descartes, all things are made for the sake of man. Uh, capital M, obviously. Carl Linnaeus. <coughs> uh, Carl Linnaeus, of course, has uh, uh, dealt a lot with the classification of species, as you know. Man has rendered the earth more proper. So these, these ideas have really dominated and fit into this sort of old view. The earth upon which we depend are mostly ignored in our ethics. It's, it's, and you think about it, it's a bit uh, crazy. I mean, you wouldn't ignore something that's central to your very survival. But we, we pretty much do that over the years <clears throat> for a lot of reasons. The earth is pretty much a cross out. We, we, we are changing that to some degree, but it may have to be on a mm, deeper level, as represented in these kinds of statistics. 5,000, so 0.005% uh, uh, represents really the approximate amount of time in the 3.6 billion year history of the earth that humans have been on the planet. So by any type of uh, all of the necessary, all the necessities to live were invented millions of years ago by microlife, such as bacteria and algae. Uh, this should tell us that solutions, answers may depend on humility. 
probably extreme humility. You know, it's very hard to go to somebody and say, well, you know, you should be listening to the bacteria, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but nature as a mentor is a good vehicle, and we need to see that more in education. Nature as a mentor. It isn't necessarily dogmatic or so prescriptive. It's just saying, let's put nature uh, first and learn from some of its lessons. Not that it's all good and all bad, it's neither. But it does have certain ways that it operates in the biosphere, and we have to have the humility to face it, learn from it, and so, and so on. I mean, there you go, look at all these things in the hall of knowledge. The earth is the hall of knowledge, right? Sorry about the image here, but um, this was sent from outer space. <coughs> yeah, actually, actually, it's one that went out to outer space. The Smithsonian sent this picture in case there were any of, any of your friends out there um, because they wanted to show the stromatolites, which are these uh, formations built by cyanobacteria here and uh, volcanoes, that this was a very successful Earth and represents a lot of what the Earth was about. And success could be just realized right here. And this dominated a lot of Earth time. And of course, much of Earth time had all, this, uh, invent all these inventions, mostly by microbial inventions, photosynthesis, gene and gene transfer, reproduction, motility, respiration, metabolism, ecological associations, energy, heat distribution, regulation. And I don't necessarily uh, mean regulation with any foresight or anything like that, just through feedback mechanisms. So that's pretty impressive. Ethics without respecting place deceives us, is what I'm positing. Uh, we begin to see ourselves as the center of the world and do not even think to learn from the wisdom of nature, quote unquote. And so the and ego is a good thing. I mean, uh, if I didn't have an ego, I wouldn't be able to come up here, and you wouldn't be able to teach and do the things you do. It's, you have to believe that you got something to say, and you're you're kind of something. But on the other hand, it can obviously go too far to the point now where it's taking us down these difficult roads, to put it mildly. And this omission of not considering the earth is not something in which humans are born. Uh, I mean, you'll hear people say, "Well, that's just the way people are." No, no, no. Indigenous peoples uh, have known the importance of place, and especially the Earth, for centuries. Not all, but many. And even today, to a large degree. Uh, oh yeah, that's a picture. Oh yeah, that's so great. But that's a picture of uh, Amazon at, uh, in the Yasuni Park in Ecuador, with the mist or the transpiration from the trees. So global ecology, the study of global ecology really allows us to enter this world. It recognizes place as central, a global ecology. Uh, it is a foundation of sustainability thinking, planning, and action, I would argue. And uh, in a sense, uh, Humboldt was the first global ecologist. And there was nothing that he really looked at that didn't say, oh, is this what I saw back when I visited that area uh, in the Alps? Um, why are these plants here, but I didn't see them when I was 200 miles away, et cetera, et cetera. It always was looking for the chains of connection, how things are linked or not linked. And uh, so in a sense, without using those terms, he certainly was a forerunner. Uh, what's an example of that? Well, a first point is that the unity of nature is a strong uh, indicator of global ecology. All of these creatures um, are really 98% uh, of, of each of these uh, organisms are really made up of just eight elements, which I call the, actually nine if we put in this one. Uh, these are the sponge cafe uh, creatures. It's sponge cafe. These are sponge cafe creatures, right? Like everything else. What's the S? Okay, what's the P? The sulfur, phosphorus. Phosphorus, sulfur, yeah, what's the O? Oxygen. 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 Carbon. Hydrogen. Okay, so what's the what's the cafe? It's an uh, alkaloid-rich brown substance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that he has 30 a day of. <laughs> right. Actually, so, I have needle tracks. <laughs> so what's the uh, what's the cafe? The CA? Calcium. Calcium, thank you. And the uh, FE? Iron. Iron, yeah. So it just, it's amazing, just, just uh, combinations of those eight. And why do I give it ownership? I'm, I'm giving ownership to Ma Margaret, Maggie. Who's Maggie? Magnesium. Magnesium, yeah. Why is magnesium so important? Why would I do that? It's the 
Oxygen receptor for many invertebrates. Oxygen receptor for invertebrates, okay, one. What's another one related to what invertebrates depend upon? Uh, they depend upon what system? What's the universal system? We all do. When you eat lunch today or dinner or whatever, you're depending upon what out there? What system? Basic system. The number one system, perhaps, you could argue, on the planet that governs life. Photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Yeah, not, to, not to minimize the anaerobes, they're pretty important, but photosynthesis is involved with many anaerobes as well. They just don't use oxygen as a prime electron acceptor. But there you go. And so this Mg is in your photosynthetic, what's the main photosynthetic substance? Green chlorophyll. Okay, chlorophyll has to have magnesium in it and it recycles through the plant. And so there is no photosynthesis that we know of without magnesium in there. So it's so powerful that this ninth element, we could say, adds a little bit more to this 98% of every living thing, but that it is uh, sort of governing it in a way. So in a sense, global ecology, by looking at this, this is a, a step to really unifying life just through the, looking at the sponge cafe, the elements that we're all share in common. But let's look more specifically, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, this, is, this is a friend of yours. You don't know it's a friend of yours, I'm sorry. Um, but it is, you have, you have them with you right now. Uh, anybody have any ideas what it is? Some kind of skin mite or something. Yeah, yeah, it says mite, yeah, it's a mite. <clears throat> and, uh, and this mite lives in your eyebrows. I'm gonna make you all itchy now. Uh, it lives in your eyebrows, it's, uh, it's in your skin. And in a way it has to be, uh, it's a good thing because you're really shedding the top layer of your skin every four to six days or so, or the very top layers. You're, you're constantly giving out that dust that's in the room, in the sunlight. That dust is, uh, is your skin, it's you. Sorry, <laughs> or some friend of yours, I don't know. But, uh, and, and all that is floating around. And these creatures thankfully come ecologically, Humboldtian speaking, and uh, de devour that uh, dust or ride on it or what have you. Unfortunately, they also leave fecal pellets behind, which you breathe in and can be allergic to, as some people are. But nevertheless, they dominate. And this is a common term for dust, right? We say dust, common on pillows, clothing, bedding, prolific in the eyebrows and body hairs, metabolized, metabolized dry skin. 2,000 light fecal pellets are produced per 10-day life cycle. Wow. And uh, most interior dust is skin and mite feces. Don't leave yet, you still have a little time. Now. Uh, and, um, and they have a lot of bacteria inside of them. This is not, this is, this, is, this is a vast community here. It looks like one, but it isn't, just like you. So this is not what we're really focused on. We talk about global ecology. I wanted to say that right away because when you, the best example, one of the best examples of global ecology is talking about dust. Not this dust, not the dust in your room, however. It's a different dust, and one that maybe gets a little closer to it, just a wee bit more, is, uh, it's closer, but it's not quite there, is this. This is in Australia. People driving down the road. Another kind of dust, right, that's quite common. We see it in different parts of the earth. Uh, and that dust is really a, a, a kind of a mineral dust, right? And we see it more now with, uh, to some degree, with uh, the certification and, and issues related to climate, for sure. Uh, but it's, it's been a part of the planet and, and can be quite thick. But if you take that thick mass, okay, and put it up higher in the biosphere, and that mass is the so-called dust, in quotes, uh, it's, a, it's mineral dust. It's got all your goodies in there. It's got some of your sponge cafe and some of the non-sponge cafe in it. 
Okay, and in this case, it's just sort of a, um, a surface scene that has its own story. But let's take it up into the uh, atmosphere, and the global flow, and a global flow, it probably should read, is Sahara to Amazon. Huh? How is Sahara and the Amazon connected? You couldn't think of two more mm, biomes more uh, separate uh, than those two, perhaps. And the fact is that the uh, central, uh, north central um, Africa in the Sahara, particularly the country area we know as Chad, this uh, mineral sediment uh, in, by the winds each year in, in extensive amounts in the millions and millions of tons to the Amazon area as well as to other areas as well, not just to the Amazon. And so a lot of the nutrients are coming there um, from the Amazon and feeding into the plant systems here. In fact, there was some thought that one of the reasons why the, some parts of the Amazon are growing so much and so lush is because of the great, there's greater amounts of CO2. Um, climate deniers to some degree were saying, well, you know, obviously we want more CO2, the plants will go quicker and crops will go quicker and so forth. But a lot of the research is indicating that in fact the plants are growing uh, in a very lush, strong way right now because they're getting a great deal of iron and phosphorus and other minerals via this dust blowing from, so-called dust, from uh, North Africa. And here we see it actually leaving the area of Lake Chad. We call it the Bodele, uh, Bodele the, the Depression. And uh, it's between two mountain zones. And the winds at different times of the year pick the, uh, the sediment up and uh, blow it in huge amounts. It's one of the most uh, really terrifying areas of the world because it's pretty extreme in that sense. And of course it feeds this system here. This, this, this uh, we call this really a white river, but it's, it's, it's essentially uh, somewhat dark in color and it has a lot of sediment materials and a lot of the goodies for life in there. <clears throat> and a lot of those are organisms such as this. What's this? Any ideas? Yeah, diatome, which is uh, something if we went to Charles River right now and looked for the most common organism perhaps along the shore, almost on any shore, it would be a type of diatome covered by glass. This is glass surface and uh, silica dioxide, but it also, of course, has a lot of the sponge cafe with it. It was in the bottom of this lake, which was much larger, and now is part of the sediment. And in that are phosphorus and other uh, in different forms that are going up into the dust material. And that material is landing in the Amazon and keeping it going to a large degree. And that translates ultimately, indirectly, to this picture. Not the rainforest. Pardon me? Lake Placid. Lake Placid, yeah, it looks like that. This is another one of those pictures that you all should bow down to. Thank you very much. I gotta get a drink. It's not that kind of talk. Water. Yeah, where do you get your water from here? Quabbin Reservoir. Quabbin Reservoir, which is out in the western part of the state, well protected. There it is. Uh, nicely done in the sense of that um, <clears throat> over time, its uh, industry has been prevented from being nearby. There's not as much dangerous runoff there, although there's always some. Uh, and so on. You, probably Boston Water is one of the best in the world. Uh, one could argue. So the point is, is that this water comes from obviously cloud formation, storms and whatnot. And we know that at the equatorial regions, we have a lot of low pressure systems. We have a lot of movement of water, water flowing up, heat flowing up, taking that water into the uh, into cloud formations and storm systems that ultimately feed the rest of the planet. If we remove the rainforest now, we would have a problem with the kind of water cycle and flow that we have now. Not a complete problem, but one that would give us concern. And it's because the trees in the rainforest that we see here are transpiring. They're giving off water into the atmosphere in incredible amounts as they use it, and then it goes through the system and then out into the atmosphere. And that becomes, um, in part, part of storm systems and low pressure systems. <clears throat> so there are many ways we depend upon the rainforest, but Again, well, this picture is showing us, uh, again, this dependency that we have really on this water flow uh, on the Amazon. It's not just something divorce, it's a Humboldtian connection. Global ecology makes these connections. And in a sense, 
This again connects to climate change because we don't know how this climate can change. We know that it does, but we don't know what the anthropogenic influence would be here or whether this flow would continue. We know that it's somewhat ancient, but, or have ideas that it's somewhat ancient, but we don't know to what degree we will affect this. And this could have ramifications over long distances, that chain of connection over long distances. And so this, is a, this goes into a larger story, but the global ecology really is what feeds our uh, Earth ethics in a broader way, um, and even in very direct ways. Here we see that photosynthesis depends upon uh, ferrodoxin. Okay, this is a, uh, a protein, and the protein needs to be there for photosynthesis to go forward. So again, uh, the movement of iron from uh, North Africa is feeding the development of these trees uh, that are so important to us and for biodiversity on the planet. It's also destroying corals in the Caribbean. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and some of it is doesn't it even allow some uh, fungal growth? Doesn't it's, it? It's aspergillus. Aspergillus. Yes. Yeah, so, so it has you know many stories to it. Uh, so Chad, Badele, uh, North Africa area. Uh, ancient and recent microbial life. You got to summarize this. Feeds the feeds the uh, Chad area. Feeds the, the water system that's near Lake Chad, which in turn translates into this movement of nutrients that they create proteins for photosynthesis and allow the plants to proliferate in, in uh, the Amazon. And you have this exchange here where you obviously have low pressure and rain systems carrying that uh, and that with a double arrow. And then to some degree it's feeding our systems here. And it has other, other stories too, including ones where it's influencing the damaging of the corals beside bleaching. So, so you have a story here that's very interconnected, and unless we, again, develop a, a deeper sense of the planet, we lose these deeper connections. We don't have the ethical mindset for actually exploring this to the large degree that we need to do. Uh, the other story that uh, helps us with uh, global ecology and with uh, mm, Earth-centered ethics is we, we really see ourselves as divorced, but the new data keeps showing us that we're anything but divorced. That one plus one actually equals one, not two or three or whatever we talked before. Um, that in fact, and this really puts us closer to nature than we ever realized, each individual is actually a community comparable to the larger ecosystems that we depend upon globally. Okay, each individual is a community. Everyone in here is a community. We now know that. Uh, there are several uh, revolutionary, uh, or at least game-changing uh, pieces. These are summary pieces, review pieces, by a distinctive group of people, and uh, also uh, here people connected also to uh, Boston University here in the past, Alfred Tauber. But here, uh, symbiotic view of life, we have never been individuals. So, see, you don't have to feel alone anymore. Feel alone. So you, you have all your pals and partners in here. It's hard to talk to, uh, I agree. But, you know, talk is, you know, talk is shaky, right? Just listen to me. It's, it can only go so far with this. Realization that, uh, that we really are ecosystems, much like when we look at a wetland or a rainforest or, or ecosystems within those biomes, uh, that we're really not that much different. Uh, we're mobile and, and moving these around. We know that symbiosis is very much involved, or partnerships in nature are very much involved with corals. Dinoflagellates and a larger microbial community are involved, especially with reef making corals. Um, indeed, reefs can't be made. The big platforms that life really lives on in substantial amounts really can't happen until they're infected, I would say, infected by a dinoflagellate. This is a fungus that's in the root systems, and this is another partnership. This tree is not, it's not going to reach any of its potential in its life cycle without its partner, this fungal partner that brings in phosphorus from the, from the trees and that has this long-term uh, co-evolution, if you will, or even perhaps more powerful than that. And this is a, um, again, the bacterial populations are huge. There are actually more bacterial populations 
uh, in us than we have our own human cells. We have more non-human cells than human cells in and on us. And so that should tell us something. Uh, so we really are, and we look at some of the, the, so many of these charts and so forth that came out of uh, the uh, modeling of the uh, human genome and other studies. But, you know, when we look back at the roots of a lot of our genetic expressions, um, mm, we see that a larger, this is, this is actually uh, prokaryotic, pro, this is actually eukaryotic but microbial. So the microbial world dominates, particularly bacteria, in describing um, uh, where our genes, let's put it that way, where our genes originally were found and then changed over time or, uh, or really adapted to different situations. So we're, we have a strong bacterial component in our genetic history. <clears throat> And it's reflected now in a lot of studies in many reputable journals. This is becoming a more common expression, and it applies to us who are concerned about, who are interested in climate change. And here we see that the microbiota in our intestine uh, really are the feeding out points for all the other systems of our body. Normally we would put the brain in there, but it appears as if, um, and it makes some sense, the food centers, just like uh, to some degree, in the ecosystems, in the broad ecosystems we see, the centers of food production that then go out into the, into the widespread community on the food chain, that's often what the whole system revolves around. And it turns out the human body is not that much different. And we have an extensive microbiota there with a lot of study being in there. It's second only to climate change. So while Earth-centered ethics makes some sense, it would be a huge change in how we think and feel and, and thinking of all in these kinds of ways. Uh, so why should we feel this way? This was some research that I did, um, I was involved with. I certainly wasn't a lead researcher on it, but I had, had my nose in it. <laughs> uh, in a way, I wish I didn't, because uh, it looks like a nice place, right? This is a nice place. It's in Poland, but, I'm not, but it could be uh, one of over mm, six or 7,000 sites around the world. This is a beautiful uh, green area, but this is a threatened area here. Um, and it's because this kind of dust, this is a different dust altogether, um, it was made up here, and this is a little piece of this whole area that would extend away from the picture of contaminated soil from leftover mining operations. And everything that we see, for example, in this picture, is zinc and lead uh, with some stones in there. This here is a better picture of it showing uh, zinc and lead dominance throughout here, left behind. This is incredibly toxic and poisonous. This is, uh, so here is, here is the, uh, here is that element, those elements, very dangerous world, and of course it blows up into local communities, extends and can cause major problems. Uh, we're, lo we, we're looking at these, our researcher colleagues, whoops, can I do that? Um, uh, these are researcher colleagues in uh, one from Germany, one from uh, Italy, and they're looking at if we can find uh, plants that will actually uh, absorb a lot of that uh, lead and zinc and other heavy metals such that at least the soil is held by these plants, that they can survive there. And it's the mycorrhizae, those fungi that I mentioned before, that would be assimilating all of those metals and holding them here. So we're looking for the right combination of that fungal association with the right plant that would grow in that environment. Um, so it's, it's an example, again, of how when you talk about do we need earth-centered ethics, this is not uncommon. This is vast areas of the planet having these contaminated areas by humans. <clears throat> we have so many examples, and I won't go through too many of these so you don't get too depressed, but, and, and you know many of them anyway, this is, of course is uh, in uh, a view from uh, space uh, looking down in the uh, Amazon. Uh, this is approximately, uh, I think it's 1975, and this is 1987. Uh, and this represents all the development and so forth that's gone on, all the infrastructure. Uh, this is also a reduction of CO2 removal and instead a replacement of CO2 dispersal, or carbon dispersal here carbon removal here. Now we can't return back the world to this world here, but we need the thinking and the ethics that 
recognize the importance of this to be more at play here. And I think it's an ethical and not just a policy plug-in story of uh, let's come up with some kind of solution, a green solution. It's a different way of thinking. We see it here in, in these six expressions. This is all, this is the same picture. It's just 100 years apart. Anybody know what the city is? Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong. And this is Hong Kong uh, a little over 100 years ago. And this is Hong Kong today. Not that cities are bad things, but obviously the infrastructure here and all the things we've done uh, have not taken in earth-centered ethics. Home is not uh, earth-centered here. And, and whereas here, there's not that much concern about it because there isn't that kind of uh, structure uh, development. There hasn't been that kind of development. So when you see those kinds of pictures, you see that the ways of thinking have to be changed in a deeper way, educationally at all levels. Here we have Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and this is just a few days later, these pictures are a few days later. This picture is the rainforest. What do I mean? It's gone up in smoke. It's smoke. Yeah, this is a nearby rainforest that is burning and coming into the city causes tremendous health hazards in the city. These pictures have to be shown to students and to people and to be shared. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're working to make people depressed and sad, but if we're really serious about climate change education, um, sustainability, and so on, we have to see how things have played out and how we really need to make it a, uh, these changes part of our ethics, the way we think. We can't keep putting humans in the center of the picture, and that's what we uh, substantially do. It's not a very good picture, but this is the tar sands in Alberta. This is forest land. This is after the, the uh, oil exploration on the surface. It's quite extensive area. And feeding into pipelines and so forth. This is part of our addiction, right? It's part of the addiction. Uh, might be, somebody say, a political point. It's really just a biospheric point. We, there's a species on Earth that's, that requires, or thinks that it requires something. It's an addiction. And, and the system that it built, that it built, keeps needing this. So we need, uh, a, a, I would say, an, uh, an ethical, among other changes, to turn that around. It's represented by this number, which has actually grown a little bit, uh, the McKibben number, as it's called. This is the amount of billions of tons of uh, fossil fuels in the earth today and which are planned to be extracted and burned for energy by humans. This is, this is the, the amount that's in the earth and uh, taking it out of the earth will of course raise the temperatures. We know the correlation is accurate, uh, reasonably accurate that the more carbon you have in the atmosphere, CO2, uh, the more you, you're likely to increase uh, temperatures and certainly alter climates. <clears throat> so, so here uh, is a very dangerous uh, number. And that's why when you see some people and scientists, especially a lot of climate scientists, uh, are very concerned about this. Uh, it's not an easy issue and it's not a simple one. There are all different sides to it. But bottom line is that there's a lot of problems in releasing this uh, fossil fuel uh, for our future. Uh, and an extreme end of this, what's this? It's not a bowling ball. It's the sun. Yeah, it looks like the sun. It's uh, Venus. Well, it's just as hot. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, here's the Earth. And look at this. Uh, we're, pretty, we're right over here. Here's uh, Venus, second planet out. Venus' atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide. And, it, <laughs> and the Earth is point, roughly 0.04%. So the Venus surface temperature is 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and of course the Earth's surface is 55. We don't have to worry about going to that kind of level, uh, but it just shows again what oh, the CO2 uh, heat correlation in part. It's a bigger story than that, but certainly the amount of carbon dioxide there is a significant factor in why it's so warm there, and also there's no life there to remove the CO2, and uh, there has never been. Uh, and of course, sometimes we think of these things as long term. Here's Boston um, about 10,000 years ago. And we was under the ice, right where we're sitting now. And this is not that long from a geological point of view. It's not long at all. Uh, but this is the mass of ice. So climates can change very quickly, particularly when humans, again, are not operating uh, with place, with, uh, with a recognition of their real home. So it's hope it happened millions of times, obviously climate change and 
students have to learn that. They shouldn't, we really should not be dealing with educating ourselves and others thinking that there's only been like one climate change and we're a big cause of it or something like that. It's always here and been here for millions of years, but this is the first time that we've been around for these climate changes, of major climate changes, and that we are substantially a cause of it through uh, factories and cars and all the other things that you've read about and know about. <coughs> So we're involved now with the with a human deluge. Non-coastal residents of the world can expect unprecedented numbers of climate change refugees. Uh, we have over 500 million people living within three meters above sea level, at or below sea level, moving and providing for even a fraction of this will, of course, mean major upheaval. This is not a small issue, and so sometimes you get people say, "Well, I don't live near the ocean, so you know, leave me alone." You know? But uh, obviously, the story affects everyone from a number of different standpoints, food dispersal and, and movement, transportation, but this as well. We have problems with, uh, with refugees crossing, and people want to build walls across the Mexican border. I mean, so... Uh, only, only one guy in particular. Yeah, well... Uh, and, and the point is, is that um, the, the whole world will be in a refugee mode if we... Uh, don't uh, change some habits quickly. And then we see local, various coastal areas, the Pacific Exodus particularly is in the Maldives now, where a number of people have to be you know, moved somehow. Um, so when we look at all these people, they're practicing in a sense without even using the term, the leadership around the world is substantially practicing Earth-centered ethics. Um, in all of these countries, we need to get it more in our lives on a daily basis. This is a famous program, you should take a look at it sometime, the Bayfoot College of the Himalayas. Very inspiring training women to be solar engineers, and the only way you get into their college is by being illiterate. It's trained literally thousands of women over the years, uh, particularly mothers, grandmothers, to be solar engineers over a six month period of time. And that program is growing. We need more thinking like that even here. So earth earth sense of ethics really means valuing humility, seeing ourselves as part of nature and not above it. The question is how do we fit into the earth and its systems? That's not a question that teachers are necessarily raising in curriculum now. They, they might see it as somehow a political question, but it isn't. It's just a reality question of how the biosphere works and if we want to be a part of it. Uh, biodiversity is recognized, valued, learning about the world, Earth uh, and the Earth in and out of schools, being outdoors, communities, nature as a teacher, as we mentioned before, energy efficiency and recycling, and conservation and no waste, reducing a carbon footprint, and then looking at your own impact. This should be a part of our educational activities uh, all, the, all the time. It shouldn't be something that's just some so-called activist. I always wonder what an activist is. I think it's somebody who's attempting to practice democracy but, or speak out, but whatever. Uh, certainly a teacher needs to pay attention to this, and there's no other way of doing it except getting your feet dirty, that is, getting involved, maybe uh, not always being popular, uh, but having some courage, and uh, Speaking, speaking, so, oh, did you consider this? You read some meeting. No one's thinking about sustainability. Ah, but did you think of this? Uh, they might not like you, but on the other hand, it's better to say it and to raise the question, get people thinking, than, than not. Solutions start with ourselves and valuing the earth as an educational priority. Uh, that's uh, what a lot of people are doing. <laughs> Um, yeah. So we try to do some things. Getting kids out of nature is important. If you don't get out of nature, then it's harder to fall in love with something if you're not close to it. Oh, jeez, I never said it like that. But yeah, if you, that's what do I say? Yeah, if you like. It's hard to fall in love with something if you're not close to it. Oh yeah, it's hard to fall in love with something if you're not close to it. And we want people to fall in love with the earth. And it's their home, it's their survival, it's their kids, it's their... So they have to be out and enjoy it and laugh in it. And so that's what we try to do without too much pressure. Uh, and what others are doing with a lot of schools and programs and la da And the teachers working at a workshop as well. And um, there's, a, uh, there's people working in the program, one sitting in the room. 
Um, and uh, yeah, this is always a good uh, point to uh, close off here. When we talk about earth sensitive ethics, Bongati really represents this so well in everything that we think about with the hummingbird story, right? We are constantly being bombarded by problems that we face. And sometimes we can get completely overwhelmed. The story of the hummingbird is about this huge forest being consumed by a fire. All the animals in the forest come out and they are transfixed as they watch the forest burning. And they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless, except this little hummingbird. It says, I'm going to do something about the fire. So it flies to the nearest stream, takes a drop of water, and it puts it on the fire and goes up and down, up and down, up and down, as fast as it can. In the meantime, all the other animals, much bigger animals, like the elephant with a big trunk, could bring much more water. They are standing there helpless, and they are saying to the hummingbird, what do you think you can do? You're too little. This fire is too big. Your wings are too little. And you're big, so small. You can only bring a small drop of water at a time. But as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I am doing the best I can. And that, to me, is what all of us should do. We should always feel like a hummingbird. I may feel insignificant, but I certainly don't want to be like the animals watching as the planet goes down the drain. I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best I can. To some degree, that's our educational message, and the Earth Center eth Ethics really carries that forward to a large extent. Um, so. I thank you for your time today. It was very nice of you to hear me.